Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started in about a minute or so, so thank you for waiting. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with our webinar today. So on behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to our webinar today on SOPs, Developing and Using Effective Standard Operating Procedures. My name is Avery Davis from the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. Before we begin, I am going to cover a few housekeeping items and then we'll get started with the presentation. During the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box anytime throughout the session. We will be saving your questions for a facilitated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, you will receive a follow-up email that includes a link to the recording and other information you may need. You can also download the slides and other resources today in the handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. This session has not been submitted for pre-approval of continuing education credits, but eligible attendees will receive a certificate of attendance for their personal record. To receive a certificate for this session, you must attend for the entire webinar you must register and attend individually using your real name and unique email address. Certificates will be sent via email within 30 days of the webinar date. And if you have any questions or need assistance, please contact us at smallsystems.syr.edu. Now for a little bit about us. The Environmental Finance Center Network provides training and technical assistance to small water and wastewater systems in all U.S. states and territories through our building technical, managerial, and financial capacity programs. If your community or utility needs assistance with drinking water or wastewater system management, please feel free to contact us through our request form, which I will be sharing shortly in the chat. And on that note, I would like to introduce our presenter for today. So we have Gregory Pearson, who is the Water and Wastewater Systems Trainer at the Great Lakes Environmental Infrastructure Center at Michigan Technological University. So Greg, welcome, and I'm handing everything over to you. Thank you, Avery. Uh, Avery, uh, can can uh, you hear me uh, well and, and see the presentation well? Yep, everything looks good. Thanks, Greg. I want to thank you all for showing up today. Uh, the, the title of today's presentation, we're talking about creating and using effective standard operating procedures or SOPs. And a little quick uh, background. Greg, I can't hear your audio now. After you said a little, some little Sorry background. That. I'm not sure what, why my finger is, is trying to be on the mute button, but uh, 
I'm the, my name is Greg Pearson, and uh, I'm coming to you from the uh, Great Lakes Environmental Infrastructure Center, which is located in Region 5, the EPA Region 5. And we're located also in Michigan Technological University. So we're kind of housed in the engineering, the civil engineering department. And uh, I've been a water and wastewater operator. I'm still a certified water and wastewater operator and a utility manager and a technical assistance provider and trainer in the industry for quite some time now. I worked in several different uh, EPA regions across the nation. And you can see a couple of photos that I saved, one of me on the left working at a tribal uh, facility and in the middle teaching a class in, in a, a location, a, a wastewater system. And you can see a little bit of what uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan looks like, in the, at least in the summer. And in the winter, it's hard to find liquid, liquid form of water up here. Let me see if I can make this work now without muting myself. Okay. So SOP, Standard Operating Procedures, uh, a list of task steps uh, can be applied in a lot of different ways uh, in, in water and wastewater systems. Uh, a lot of times we think of it as the operational aspect. You see a, a gentleman there making a, an adjustment at an activated sludge facility, uh, a lady uh, doing an inspection, it looks like, on some type of pumping system, and uh, even some laboratory work going on. But SOPs could even uh, be used for financial aspects or for planning aspects. Uh, they can be used in a lot of different ways. So we're going to go to our first poll question before we launch into the content. Uh, does your utility currently have and use any standard operating procedures? And Avery will bring up that first poll for us. Yeah, so your answer options are we have SOPs but are not actively using them. Yes, we have SOPs and use them. No, we do not have SOPs but use standard procedures. And no, we do not have SOPs or standard procedures. So I'm going to leave this up for a few more seconds. It looks about like about 70% have answered. So it's closing in three, two, one. Can you see when I share those results, Greg? I cannot. So it looks like, <laughs> yeah, it looks like 13% uh, have them but are not actively using them. 60% and our winner today is they have them and use them. Um, and 20% do not have them but use standard procedures and eight percent does not have either that's a, I'm, I'm actually surprised i thought that um, that c would be the higher amount but uh, when you look at question a we have sops but are not actively using them i suspect um, that situation would be some outside entity created sops and didn't really involve the staff there uh, and I'm glad to hear that that the highest percentage is we have a good a good group of people today that that have SOPs and are using them. And uh, the the system that I started out in was more um, was closer to C because uh, we were a small system and we didn't actually have any written SOPs, but we kind of developed standard ways of doing things. And uh, but uh, we're going to look at the benefits of actually. Uh, writing down our SOPs and how that can help us in a lot of different ways. And when I was researching this topic, you'd be surprised how many SOP jokes there are that you come across. And I'm gonna share a couple of them with you, just because they they also highlight some issues with SOPs. Here are the first uh, little meme that I came across, making an SOP about, about making SOPs. That's kind of what we're doing today. So I'm the brunt of that joke today. And uh, SOPs might 
might not get people too excited. Uh, you know, oh, here comes another step-by-step uh, -step method that we have to follow. And uh, there's this is a very uh, true situation as well. Uh, when you don't have an SOP, it gives you maybe in your mind at least some flexibility that uh, that you wouldn't have to follow a, a rigid uh, set of steps. And then finally, uh, the situation where you have so many SOPs that it becomes burdensome. And I, I believe uh, if we follow some some uh, basic principles, we can avoid uh, some of these problems. So here we're going to launch into our content, and we see a, a person down in a, uh, a pit making some adjustments there. Looks like a, possibly a confined space issue. And we see some people out making uh, a repair. It looks like a full circle clamp uh, to some kind of a water piping system. So those are all things that it would be good to have standard operating procedures. And uh, we also see that these are also situations that that might have a lot of variations in them. Uh, not every uh, not every uh, lift station or or uh, pumping uh, pit or valve pit or not every uh, not every water main repair is going to be the same. There's going to be variations. Some of those water main leaks and breaks are going to be in the middle of a busy intersection, and some will be deep, and some will be uh, more difficult, and some will be easier. And there's going to be a lot of variations in the type of pipe and and so forth. So, so how do we create SOPs that that can meet all those particular needs? So first of all, let's start out by kind of defining what we're talking about, what an SOP is, a standard operating procedure, and now it's basically a step-by-step -step guide for completing the, a task at its core. But we're going to see we're going we're going to actually have about nine components to an SOP when we get done. When we I found uh, some some good examples that uh, we can we can talk about that gives us a kind of a standard approach to developing a good SOP. So why why do we develop SOPs? Well, it helps us to do the task in the same way each time, kind of standardizes the task. It also uh, can help us to connect our procedures to an industry standard, for example, an AWA standard or a, or a WEF standard. And we can also use SOPs for training, and it can become part of our operation and maintenance manual. So when a new person comes on and they go through the O&M manual or, or they go through onboarding training, they, we can use those as SOPs in that way. Um, think about the experienced operators at your utility, or, or maybe you are an experienced operator or a new operator. Those uh, experienced operators may have a lot of knowledge about the system in their head, uh, and it may not have found its way into some kind of a written form. Uh, so that's another uh, very viable uh, aspect of standard operating procedures, just like asset management. It's a way to record that, that knowledge that was gained possibly over decades of operating and maintaining a system. Now, that little meme about, you know, that uh, the one that said, why do you have so many SOPs? Obviously, we don't want to become victims of, of our own procedures. We don't want to have the procedures uh, so uh, so rigid that it actually impairs our, our work. And we don't want to have SOPs for things that don't really need it. So, but for certain types of critical tasks, uh, we definitely want to have SOPs. Now, how do we identify when an SOP is needed? Well, first of all, we can think about the consequences of failing to do the task correctly. And that can help us to think about, do we really need an SOP? And the, there's four categories that we could think about. Is it going to affect compliance? I was looking through some, uh, some violations in the water and wastewater industry. And there was a whole lot of uh, of wastewater releases into the environment, and a lot of them were were due to someone turning the wrong valve, or 
not knowing how to correctly uh, remedy a, a, a situation with the equipment. And the majority of, of compliance violations were tied to a category that was called inadequate startup procedures. That was the, that was the uh, of all the compliance violation causes, the highest column was the one that said startup procedures. Also safety, anything that would uh, be a safety issue. Confined space is obviously a big one, but you can see someone, uh, a group of people that are that are uh, putting on uh, some lock, lockout and tagout kits before they're going to work on a, a panel there. So anything that would be, be a safety or a public safety issue. Anything that might cause an, a service outage. And finally, anything that's going to result in a lot of cost. Those would be four good reasons to develop an SOP. So you could just have regular work instructions or just some worker helps. And those are very valid things to have. Uh, for example, maybe you post a little something at the at the wellhead when somebody's going to mix the uh, the sodium hypochlorite solution at a well. Maybe that maybe that's just a simple set of instructions, uh, a couple steps that that you could that you could write out or print out and put right at that location. Uh, it would maybe just uh, help someone to go through the steps easily. Maybe something like that uh, may or may not need a fully developed SOP. So help guides and and work instructions like an overhaul manual would have, um, maybe that's needed. And in other cases, an SOP might be needed. So an SOP though, it actually has a lot of detailed information in it. It assigns who's going to be responsible, who's going to carry out the task, what the task actually is, but how also is it going to be confirmed that it's been done successfully? Like the like the example of the of the chlorinator, if you're setting a chlorine feed rate, how would you how would you know that's been done successfully? Well, you would go out and actually take a sample uh, a little ways downstream, knowing that it's going to take a little a little bit of pipe to, for that uh, that chlorine to mix adequately with the water, and so you'd know you know, where to take that that sample and, and how to take it. And that would be one, uh, for a simple task, that would be how you would confirm that it's been done successfully. When the task would be performed and the types of locations where the task is performed. And one last W, how the task is to be performed. So that would be the instructions and, and possibly the safety uh, precautions that would need to be taken and so forth. Maybe there's some dig alerts in, involved as well. I'm gonna show you a couple of, uh, of scenarios here that I'm calling the bloopers and takeouts real here, um, but uh, these are serious situations as well. So the first example is a reverse turbine pump. Uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, run a centrifugal pump backwards, it's not necessarily going to cause as much damage as a deep well turbine pump. And every once in a while you hear this happening. So you have an installer and they have three phase wiring. And as you know, if you, you uh, exchange just two of those wires, the pump can run backwards. So we have this very confident installer and uh, the the person is sure that the three-phase wiring is hooked up correctly. And the procedure says that we should just lightly bump the starter to make sure the shaft is going in the correct direction. But in this case, the installer says, I'm gonna skip that step and hooks up the pump. And uh, when the pump turns on, it's rotating backwards at full power and causes the impellers to unscrew and the the casing uh, is in contact with the bowls and it causes extensive damage, bends the shaft, ruins the bearings, ruins the impellers. And we do have a, a electrical breaker on this pump, but within the that short period of time of 
say maybe even one second, the damage has already been done. Another uh, point to think of is how explicit do we need to be in our instructions? When I think about the generation uh, that may be retiring now, that uh, some of the folks uh, that have worked in water for decades, um, and maybe they, uh, you know, first of all, we need to make sure that knowledge is transferred to the new people coming in. But just kind of thinking about how someone that's, uh, you know, of retirement age and all of their life experiences and, you know, they people that are retiring now didn't grow up with, with uh, easy access uh, to information like we have now. We have the internet and and cell, phone, cell phones, and so maybe they communicate in a little different way. Then uh, I'm not sure what the name of the current generation is, what Generation Z or the, uh, millennia, millennia, uh, millennials or so forth, but the, uh, those two uh, uh, generations may have different ways of communicating. And so we need to be very clear, and we have to think about the kinds of things we might assume someone knows, and but they don't actually know it. Um, so the little joke here is, is here's a set of instructions that is not explicit enough. A second uh, uh, little blooper here, um, there's a 480 volt uh, pump starter that needs to be replaced. So the operator uh, has the part, but he left the lockout tag out back at the utility shop. So he just decides, you know, he knows the SOP says to put the lock and lockout tag out, uh, but he's there now and he just says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just going to turn the HOH switch, the handoff auto switch onto off and he starts working. But while he's busy, he or she, uh, another operator comes along and sees that pump switch is, is set to off and flips it back to auto. And bad things could happen, right? Someone could get injured or, or a piece of equipment could, could become damaged. And here is the last little blooper I'll show you. This is a, a very recent um, violation that, uh, that happened. An employee had a problem at a... Uh, piece of equipment and uh, overrode the alarm quite a few times. I think I think my finger would be, would be injured if I if I overrode the alarm for 460 times, but obviously that person could have uh, maybe had access to what should have been done with that equipment problem. And uh, obviously they didn't have the access to the information or or chose to ignore it, or didn't receive adequate training, or something. Uh, so therefore, it resulted in a in a wastewater spill into a protected water. So that happened on August 12th, just just uh, just last month. And uh, I wanted to share this with you as well. This is a uh, a fairly recent article that was put out by Viola Water in uh, June of this year and they had uh, the six mistakes that industrial facilities make that result in wastewater problems and guess what number one was SOPs they said uh, that, uh, that what was lacking was a formalized process control management plan that included standard operating procedures for each aspect. One interesting thing uh, that they say here, they talk about uh, that, it, that if a facility is already having issues with training and hiring and retaining staff, uh, the loss of, it's, I'll just read directly here, uh, the, the second paragraph about midway down, the loss of one person with institutionalized knowledge can be detrimental to wastewater operations. So that goes to the point about transferring knowledge from more experienced operators to some kind of form where it can be shared, and that would be an SOP. 
So I'm going to start sharing the suggested format now with you. And there's basically uh, nine components, uh, seven components to the actual uh, SOP and two components that are more administrative in nature. So the administrative part, first of all, a title page. And that's actually important to be able to, to uh, find the SOP and to have a name that, that really describes what the SOP is about. So you want to use a, a standard naming procedure as well and maybe some kind of standard filing uh, procedure that will help you to, to uh, track and find the SOP when you need it. And the second administrative aspect is a document control page. That's how you can track any revisions that you make. Uh, maybe you might have a place uh, where uh, maybe some kind of higher authority approves it, and you might even use it as a way for employees to acknowledge that they've received and received training on this SOP. So it could be very good. Uh, if you're a utility manager, uh, you could maybe use that information to know what employees have been trained and maybe you even use the SOP for continuing education among staff. Could be part of an onboarding program and that those tracking documents could uh, could help you to know who's been trained. Have they gone through the, maybe there's a, a dozen SOPs that are really critical and maybe those become part of a, a new employee onboarding program. Now, when we get to the actual SOP contents, there's seven aspects and we're gonna go through each one. First of all, definitions, where you're defining any acronyms or, or terms that might be unusual. Listing the responsibilities, uh, who's gonna be involved, and what is their uh, credentials and, and so forth. The scope or purpose of the SOP, what's it intended uh, to achieve. Health and safety hazards. This has to do with uh, the worksite setup. What kind of training is needed? What kind of skills do the employees need? And listing any uh, personal protective equipment as well, or PPE. Number five, here's what we usually think of as the core of the SOP. We get to the procedure, and that includes the required tools and step-by-step -step procedures. Number six is the data recording. Um, I was thinking about this the other day uh, with water in, in regard to water mains. When we're trying to do an inspection or a condition assessment of our water or wastewater system, uh, some of the underground infrastructure is not easily accessed. You, it's not. It would be very difficult, and uh, it wouldn't be in, wouldn't be practical at all to go and dig down to water mains to see what kind of condition they're in. However, if we ever have an event where we actually are going to go down to the water main to install a water service or to repair a leak or something, that gives us a a a special opportunity to assess that water main. You know, so we're going to be digging down to the water main, and we'll we can record things like how thick is it, uh, is it corroding, uh, is there any cracking, or uh, so you can you can have a special uh, data collection procedure that uh, maybe a sheet that guides the, whoever the operator is or the repair person to actually collect that data. So the data recording is very important. It, you, it gives you an opportunity to list exactly what kinds of data you want to be gathered and how it will be stored. And the last one is any references that, they, that the SOP is based on. For example, you might have an AWWA standard for repairing water mains, so we'll look at an example of that. Or maybe some kind of a, a, a affluent standard or so, or so forth. Let's look at each one of these individually. Right after we do poll number two, I'm going to read through this poll. And when we bring up the actual poll, it's going to be kind of abbreviated because we can't fit that many characters in. So I'm going to give you a scenario. 
And think about this scenario as if it's happening at your utility right now. We knock on wood, right? We don't want this to happen to your utility. But let's just suppose this was the situation right now. And we have a, a very small utility here, two operators and one manager, probably a managing operator. And one of the op operators has been working for only two weeks. So one, one of these three operators is uh, a very new employee. And this operator has been shadowing the, the senior operator. But what we have, the situation we have today is the manager has gone on vacation. And today the senior operator called in sick. So the only person at work is the new operator. He's been there for two weeks. So think about your utility, uh, what kind of onboarding and training program you might have for a new employee. And that would give you an idea about how much training this person's received. Uh, and think about also the resources you might have at your utility, uh, operation, operations and maintenance, maintenance manual, SOPs, some kind of instructions. So what, what happened today? Well, we had a power outage. 11 a.m., there was a power outage that knocked out power to about half the town, and the main well and disinfection system uh, for that well also has no power. But there's a generator at this location. So here's the question that we're going to be thinking about. What would the new operator need to do at this at this moment to find the information that the operator would need to get the generator started and get the well and disinfection system back online? What what resource do you have there? And the operate up op, the uh, options that you have for this question would be they can just go to the bookshelf and get the O and M manual and look it up. You have it all recorded there, and there's SOPs inside the O and M manual. Maybe you have your SOPs in a digital format. The employee can just log in and 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 find detailed generator startup information. Maybe there's even a video that that your utility produced that the op, that the operator can watch. Uh, answer C: The operator has already already received training. That was the maybe that was the week one. They learned how to start up the generator. Maybe there are some kind of instructions at the well house that tell step by step how to start up the generator. Or if there's no instructions available, the only option left would be the new operator would have to try to call someone, try to get a hold of the manager who's on vacation or get a hold of the, of the senior operator who's sick. So pick one of these, considering this to be your utility, where, where would that new operator be able to find the information? And Avery will bring up the actual poll. Yep, the poll is running now. We have about 40% who have answered. So we're just going to give it a little bit longer. Okay, the poll is closing in three, two, one. So the the most common answer was the O and M manual at forty two percent, followed by contacting someone at thirty percent, um, and then the instructions at the well house are at. 11%, the operator is only is already trained, 10% and 8% for the online digital resource. Very good, very good. I like the I like uh, the uh, I like this class. Uh, a, a large uh, portion of of the class indicated you already have the O&M manual developed with SOPs. That's great. I also like the instructions at the wellhouse too. We could do both, right? And uh, I know that in my experience as an operator, when I when I first started as an operator, I I, I would have uh, probably needed to have have called 
course, I, I kind of came from a, I kind of came from a mechanical environment before I, when I got into the water uh, business. So maybe I would have known how to figure it out, but uh, I wouldn't have had access to an SOP. Um, so I'm, I was in the same boat kind of as you 30% uh, where the operator would have had to call to get the actual information. So let's look at each one of these here in a little more detail. First of all, we'll look at the title page. Now this particular uh, SOP, uh, they have their logo and uh, they've named the SOP Emergency Repair of Water Mains. And that's a very clear title. It clearly indicates what this SOP is gonna be about. And notice it's, it has a SOP number, number 3, 311. Um, it's dated when it, was, when it was produced. And this is the first, um, the first um, iteration. Because you can see the, the revision, uh, they've, they've made a place to capture revisions. Uh, but no revisions have been made yet. But that was that's a, that's a good uh, addition to have a way to track revisions because we want to know that we're getting the the most updated, the most recent SOP. Now we're going to move on to the administrative page. This is our document control page. Let's take a look at it. You notice they have a a version control. And there's been no uh, revisions yet, but this would let you know how many revisions have been done, when was it done, and who approved it. You know, and the description would tell you, you know, what was actually changed on the SOP, what part did we update, and why. Now, notice at the top of the page in the header section, it uh, says emergency repair of water mains. When you put something in a running header like that. No matter what page you're on, you can just look up to the top of the SOP and say, okay, I might, you know, you might get on page 12 and you, and you, for some reason, you might think, well, what, what was the name of this SOP? Well, there it is. And also, this SOP has included a place for the staff acknowledgement, where when people, uh, members of the staff receive training, they can sign and date that SOP. And that then you can verify that they've received training on this. Now we're going to move into the actual contents. The first one is the definitions uh, section, definitions page. And here's a little example of uh, the definitions used in this SOP. They're using AWWA, if you didn't know what that meant, American Water Works Association. And the only one that would have been unfamiliar to me was the EAM because I would have probably been using a different system, but that's called the Enterprise asset management that is the what they're using for data entry to uh, to capture all of their their maintenance activities and and part numbers and so forth we have the occupational safety and health administration osha ppe personal protective equipment and and they've even defined milligrams per liter because there's probably going to be some disinfection activities happening with this um, with this uh, main repair. Now let's look at the responsibilities. It's a key page and they've called it key personnel and responsibilities. So they have three, uh, three per, uh, pers personnel types here. The water distribution foreman, the water distribution operator, and you notice it, it specifies two through four uh, will be needed, and um, depending on how large the the work is, and the laboratory laboratory technician, and it uh, specifies some duties here. The foreman is going to oversee the repair, but also the foreman is going to document the repair in the EAM system. Look at that last that last bullet under the water distribution foreman. Last bullet says document the break including the type of break, uh, the repair conditions, all the activities, 
the process used for disinfection and all sampling results and document them in the enterprise asset management system. So that's, that's one of the foreman's duties. For the distribution operator, they're actually conducting the repairs, but they're also collecting uh, disinfection samples and they're collecting bacteriological samples. They deliver them to the laboratory. The laboratory technician analyzes the bacteriological samples. So they're going to be repairing this main and flushing and disinfecting it, and they want to make sure that it's safe before they put it online. Now, notice also on the laboratory technician that they analyze the bacteriological samples and report the results to the water distribution foreman. So you see there's a, a full circle going on here. Let's move on to the next section. The scope and purpose describes what the SOP is intended to accomplish. Let's look at that. So I, I think I'll just read up the first part of this here. Maybe the whole thing, let's see. Um, so the, what it's doing, it's outlining the main break repair procedures according to a certain standard. And they describe that here. The purpose of this SOP is to outline the procedures for repairing a main break, including any necessary flushing, disinfection, and water quality testing, so it's very comprehensive, to be conducted before a main is placed back into service. The procedures presented herein are, are based on the Water Research Foundation report, effective microbial control strategies for main breaks and depressurization, depressurization and should be used in conduction with the AWWA standard Six, C651 disinfecting water mains. So they have two references, and we'll see those included in the reference section, I believe, as well. As not all breaks can be repaired in the same manner, crews should use their best judgment when implementing the procedures below. So they've added some flexibility into it as well. Now let's move on. In health and safety, it says we should list the hazards the worksite set up the training and the PPE. So think about the safety hazards that could exist when you're repairing a main break. I mean, there could be uh, gas lines and electrical lines, and uh, there could be deep trenches and excavations. There could be a, a lot of uh, need for safety setup. So let's take a look. So this section describes all the hazards that you might encounter. So Let's look at that bullet point hazards. Uh, you want to provide a detailed description of each type of expected hazard and worksite design factors. So you could have traffic hazards. Imagine if you have an open trench at night, you may need lighting, uh, some kind of uh, a flagger, uh, some kind of uh, cones or structures to direct traffic around that construction site. You're going to have hazards with heavy equipment. Um, you're going to have trenchy, trenching hazards and confined space hazards possibly, and possibly hazardous chem chemicals. And if you're disinfecting, you'll have at least uh, a disinfectant chemical that will be involved there. Uh, Worksite design factors would be uh, that you're going to need uh, the right kinds of signs, cones, flashers, lighting, uh, shoring uh, devices. Um, you're going to also have some training requirements involved. Uh, you wouldn't want someone to go out to that that work site that involves a deep trench and and traffic that's not trained for those hazards. And then you want to list all the PPE. And there's just a short list there: hard hats, safety glasses, work gloves, and there may be a lot more. You probably want to have reflective um, uh, clothing on as well. So it, this is a, a, a a good time to really think through, you know, what are all the different variables here that that our crew could encounter and what kind of safety precautions do we need? Okay, here we go to the actual procedures. And this is where you list the tools and have the step-by-step -step procedures. Now the main break uh, standard is it's kind of interesting that that, that particular uh, main break standard that, that they use for repairing it has a breakdown of four types of main breaks. So type one, uh, you have a, a pipe that 
it's not depressurized. It still has positive pressure on it, but it's leaking. And where you go all the way over to type four, you've had a complete loss of pressure, and uh, which is going to indicate that you're going to have a lot more problems with uh, contamination and so forth. A lot more flooding, a lot more damage probably to the to the street and to the under underlying uh, bedding and everything, possibly. So you see on the top it says equipment required, and so you that would be the place. Obviously, we can't fit it all in the slide here, but you'd have a detailed list of all the safety equipment, all the repair equipment, and heavy equipment, any kind of fill material that you might need would also be uh, included in there, like maybe some packed gravel and sand. And also you might even need system maps. So it's we wouldn't maybe normally think of a, of a map and fill material as part of our equipment, but those are all things that are needed to be there. Uh, you might have something like a main, a main a water main locator or a, or a metal detector that might be needed as well. Um, and then the step-by-step -step procedures are listed in the AWWA standard 6, C651-15, and that describes uh, the repair steps by type of by type of main break. So you see here we're we're actually using a standard and we're applying it to the procedures. Uh, obviously, this is this this slide is not large enough to list everything, but this would be your longest section. So on the uh, the little box on the right of the slide, list and describe step-by-step -step procedures sequentially, sequentially. Use clear active language. And here is an example, evaluate, that's an active word, the site for safety and set up appropriate traffic control measures. Those are clear active forms of language. And then clearly indicate any, de any decision points. So here is, is one example. If needed, disinfect the pipe in accordance with the described method outlined in AWWA standard C651. So obviously in type one where you have a positive pressure that that disinfection is not going to be as critical as in the, uh, the extreme main break in type four because you'd already have disinfected water flowing out that, that small leak, presumably. Now let's move on to the data recording section, and we already kind of talked about this. But notice that it says we're going to enter these types of data into the EAM system. So that's an electronic data storage system, and there's going to be a lot more bullets than this, but date and time of the repair, the apparent cause of the repair, the type of break, what kind of material was the pipe, uh, what was the size of the pipe, what parts were used, what inventory was used up. So we're indicating how we're going to store the data and what data we're going to collect. And we already know that the distribution foreman is the one responsible for that. This is a very important part. Um, I noticed uh, a lot of smaller systems, they, uh, they they kind of forget to budget time for recording data, and it's very important. When you think about that operator that's going to be retiring and all the knowledge that they had, uh, and also just the knowledge about what repairs have been done. If you had a a, a section of the, of the city that was experiencing a lot more uh, main breaks over time, maybe there's a break every five years and then there's a main break every three years, you wouldn't that wouldn't be something that you'd notice easily. I mean if, if something is happening happening uh, several times uh, in one year, you notice that. But if it happens every, once every five years, then once every three years, it would be very difficult to notice that the breaks are increasing, the break frequency is increasing. But if you're able to record that information into some kind of a, a system, preferably some kind of digital system, then you when you look at the data, you begin to see trends that that our minds wouldn't normally see. And the last one is the references, and we have mentioned this a few times already, but here we have the references, and you see that those three that we kind of came across as we were going through the SOP, 
First of all is the AWWA disinfecting water mains. And then the second one was the AWWA disinfection of water storage facilities. And uh, the last one was uh, the effective microbial control strategies for main breaks and depressurization that, that they mentioned in the purpose uh, page. So that kind of brings us full circle. So we know that if, if someone wanted to update this, they found a, a problem in the SOP, they could always go back to these references and uh, maybe the maybe the original uh, standard has been updated, uh, or maybe operators notice that a certain part of the SOP is not working well for them, and uh, those are both good reasons to update. There's some long-term benefits of SOPs. You can create a more effective onboarding program and continuing education program for your staff. You may even want to do some cross-training. You might have a, wa a wastewater operator that wants to uh, learn how to do some of the water tasks and vice versa. Uh, so those SOPs provide you a, a, a vehicle with which to provide that kind of cross-training. Uh, you could use the SOPs to develop an O&M manual. In fact, SOPs can just be put right into an O&M manual. Um, and capturing that knowledge of the experienced employees. I uh, also uh, added a little checklist uh, in here that can help you with, with writing a standard operating procedure. Uh, things such as uh, creating a flow chart of the process that can help you kind of to think through, uh, seeing it visually can help, help us to think about things we might have missed. Uh, just going out and, and observing uh, people doing the, the process, completing the process, could help you identify things that you might have initially missed. There might be little parts of the of the procedure that that you wouldn't think about. They're, they don't seem to be part of uh, of the particular thing you're trying to accomplish, but uh, it might be something that needs to be done. Um, so creating a flow uh, chart, assigning ownership, who's responsible for each step, uh, how often does the does the process happen? Uh, take note of any special safety precautions. Find a way uh, to track updates and reviews of the SOP. Uh, up, update your definitions and test it. You want to ideally have someone. Uh, else uh, test the, the SOP. So some tips for, for long-term implementation. Uh, I would advise, uh, and a lot of other uh, authorities uh, on the, in, in this topic, advise making the SOP a digital uh, component, having a digital component. Uh, maybe even having a video of the task being performed. But if it's digital, it, it can also make it easier to update and access and print. You want to include your employees' uh, suggestions to improve the SOP over time and involve your staff in the SOP development. I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of planning documents created by uh, outside consultants, and it wasn't something that was developed in-house and those kinds of plans tend not to get used as well. The language is different. Uh, it may be very formal when, when staff likes to talk informally. And you want to use your SOPs to provide ongoing training. Then you're using them. People are getting used to what's in there. And ideally, you have a set of SOPs that becomes part of the way we think. You know, we don't have to go and, and read the SOP anymore because it's become part of our our day-to-day -day work. And you want to budget that time in. Uh, there might be a task that takes two hours. Uh, you want to budget in that extra 20 or 30 minutes that it takes for the employees to collect the data on the site and come back and actually enter it into the system that you're using. It could be a, a computerized maintenance management system or it could even be a paper file. It uh, the form is not as important as gathering that data. Of course, it's 
it's much more beneficial to have some kind of way to enter it online. It could be something as simple as an Excel spreadsheet, or it could be something like a computerized maintenance management system that can automatically help you to, to track um, inventories and so forth. And then you can analyze the data. You might want to ask uh, some kind of a database, you know, how what's the frequency of main breaks that we've been experiencing? And you can look over the last 10 years. Um, there was a, a system that I was uh, recently uh, working with where uh, the the financial the financial manager uh, she didn't have any experience with actually running or operating a water system or wastewater system, but she was recording uh, data. She was kind of doing an asset management plan, but she didn't realize she was doing it. And she started looking at uh, these main breaks that the town had a lot of uh, older cast iron pipe. A lot of it was installed in like the early 1900s. And another section was installed in something like 1940 40 something. And uh, she noticed that uh, the 1940 cast iron pipe was actually breaking at a higher frequency than the 1900 uh, cast iron pipe. And uh, that wouldn't be something you would think would happen but she was able to identify that just because the data was there. Somehow they had, they had recorded the main break data and she took the print form and started putting it into a, into a database and was able to identify that. So the last poll here, and I'm gonna read it. It's a little more complex than Avery will bring up a, a simplified version of it. But here we have a situation here, a current SOP requires that op all operators must employ all of their arc flash personal protecti protective equipment when opening any electrical panel. So they, there's a vest and a, you know, kind of like an apron and gloves and face shield. But some of the panels are just 24 volts there's, there's for the SCADA system. And the operators are getting frustrated uh, because this personal protective equipment is an interfering with their ability to make adjustments and uh, take readings and, and do settings. So in your opinion, uh, what do you feel is the biggest concern here? So you have an SOP that's not really working well for the staff. So among these options, and this, there's no right answer. That's what you what you feel. Uh, these operators are having problems with this SOP. Could it result in them, um, in your opinion, to start ignoring uh, ignoring other SOPs? Uh, is the problem that feedback from operators is not being considered in the development? Uh, should the SOP instructions be more flexible? Is the problem with the operator's unwillingness to use the SOP? Or is the purpose of the SOP unclear? What do you think is the biggest problem here? About 60% has responded, so we're going to give it a bit longer. Okay, the poll is closing in three, two, one. So, 22% answered operators ignoring SOPs, 31% and the winner is operator feedback does not is not considered. 20% is SOP instructions should be flexible. 7% is operator unwillingness and 20% the SOP is unclear. And I think those are those are all aspects we see it's an it's very open ended, right? But those are those are all concerns with an SOP that's not working well. And as we're finishing up here, the last uh, thing that we'll look at is testing an SOP. If possible, uh, 
you should have different people try to perform the task. It could be uh, an experienced employee or a new employee, employee, or maybe someone that doesn't know anything about performing that task at your facility. Uh, could be a consultant or an engineer. Just having somebody try to do it based on those instructions would be good. There's a lot of semantics involved with communication. I was uh, just thinking about some of the ways we talk, like when somebody says, uh, put on the coffee. If you took that literally, that would be kind of silly, right? But uh, that kind of, of problem uh, can exist as well. So you want to observe them trying to perform the task and if there's any areas of misunderstanding, you can use that as a means to realize you need to edit the SOP and make it more clear and maybe have the uh, persons perform the task at different locations and settings if, if the task will be uh, performed in, in different settings. And a, a little idea for training your own staff to, to make them more aware of SOP development, you could have them uh, create an SOP, just a simple task. And uh, uh, sometimes we do this with uh, Lego, Legos, just as a simple task to build something. And then have them develop it, ask them, you know, use clear active language and uh, name the SOP with clear title and then share it with each other and see if their partner can complete the task accurately based on their instructions. That's a good exercise. If you want to, if you want, if you have staff and you want to train them on thinking through all the aspects of SOPs that could cause problems, that would be a good exercise. And uh, I want to thank you for attending. I'm going to give some time for questions if we have any, any time. Uh, but I want to leave you with uh, my email gpearson at mtu.edu if you would like to contact me for any reason with questions or other resources and also efcnetwork.org is a good place to go for all all kinds of resources and and uh, register for other no-cost trainings like this one great thank you greg we do have a couple of questions and it does great. look like we are past the two o'clock Eastern mark. So if anyone has to leave early, um, that's fine. If you're interested in viewing the Q&A afterwards, the recording will be posted on our website at efcnetwork.org. So the first two questions kind of get up the same thing. Um, a couple attendees asked, are there any computer programs or templates available to set up an SOP? As far as templates, I've seen a lot online that you can purchase. Um, I believe that the that the nine component SOP that we shared today is about as good a template as there is out there. Uh, but there is there is some out there uh, that that you can pay for, and uh, I could get you if you'd like. Uh, let me go back to my email there. Uh, if if you would like me to help find some of those companies that that provide SOPs, I'd be willing to do that. Um, in general, though, there there are enterprise uh, management programs. There's databases uh, and there's computer maintenance management systems that will help you uh, to record some of that data as well and so th then you don't necessarily need um, um, you know the paper trail as much i hope that answers the question yes thank you thank you for that answer um, we do have one question for me which is will there be a training record or um, certificate and yes if you attended the entire session today we will be sending out certificate, certificates within 14 to 30 days. Um, so that will come to you via email. It looks like the, uh, we have another question is, is there an organization that can review SOPs or make suggestions? Uh, I, I believe uh, that your technical assistance providers uh, from um, 
from rural water and from RCAP would be available. And of course, you can always run it past uh, technical assistance providers at the EFCN as well. Uh, if you would like to submit something like that, uh, if you just go to the efcnetwork.org and there's a place to submit uh, questions or requests for like technical assistance. And what would happen with that question if you're looking to have a to have a SOP reviewed, that 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 question would probably get funneled to someone who is um, an expert in that area. For example, if if you're looking to have a wastewater SOP reviewed, they would find someone who's who's an experienced wastewater operator that works within our organization, and it might be it might be someone in a in a different state, but uh, there are experts within our organization in all the different aspects of water and wastewater. Thank you. And I did drop the link to our technical assistance request form in the chat, but you can also um, reach out to some of our trainers directly because I know they, they do a lot of both. So um, I, have a, I have one more question and a comment. Um, so for the comment, someone uh, said that, that so someone said that in one place of employment, they had an SOP writing training where they had the SOP for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And yeah. they, said it was, they said it was funny what did not get included. So yeah. Good example of, of an exercise you can do. And then the last question is their company has a lot of SOPs that it can be overwhelming. Is there a good way to prioritize them to staff or organize them? Yeah, uh, the uh, the priority I believe um, is compliance and and safety, and uh, but also the uh, public health issues uh, and uh, cost. I mean, if, if if there's going to be an operator error that results in a, a damage to a a million dollar piece of equipment, that would be a concern as well. So those highly critical tasks uh, are the priority, I believe. And if, if there's an SOP that is not high priority, you should ask yourself, could the same task uh, be supported with just a simple uh, set of task instructions or a, a little employee help note card or something? And so that's how I would go about it. I would I would take some time and review the SOPs, maybe with a couple different people, maybe a technical assistance provider or a consultant, and and maybe some maybe maybe your board members have different kinds of expertise too, that where they could look at the SOP and get some different perspectives and review them. That's that would be a good procedure, I believe. Great, thank you. I believe that was our last question. Um, sorry, thank you for those who stuck around these um, these last six minutes. So big thanks to Greg for presenting with us today. And following this webinar, you will all receive a follow-up email with the slides, the other resource handouts from today, as well as a link to the recording. We also ask that you complete our evaluation so that you can let us know your thoughts on today's session as it, this helps us plan future webinars on topics that are important to you. So thank you, and Greg, do you have any final words for our audience? Oh, just thank you for attending today, and you are a great audience. I couldn't hear your roars of laughter when I told my jokes, but uh, I'm sure they were there. <laughs> Wonderful, great. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day, everyone.